sir. Well, thank you, Pastor Michael. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Morning. Oh, that's a who's the, that somebody has a really nice deep voice. I was <laughs> thought it was the Lord talking to me. So again, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Very, I knew it was you. It's always the, the guy with the big beard always has the deepest voice in the room mostly. Um, thank you, Pastor Michael, for the uh, privilege to preach this morning and open up God's Word. If you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 45. Um, I'm especially grateful that uh, Pastor Michael allowed me to uh, preach, say whatever, whatever I felt led to preach, but... Uh, Whatever I felt led to preach, I asked him when he reached out to me if y'all were in a sermon series and y'all just finished one up in Proverbs, I believe it was. And so he kind of said, hey, this is a good time to, to do a, a one-off sermon, and, and I'm grateful for that privilege. Um, as he said, I serve at Christ's Place in our discipleship role. He said promotion, and um, it may seem that way. I just like to think... They just took more stress and responsibility and put it on me and took it off of somebody else. But uh, we can call it a promotion if you want. Um, I enjoy it, though. I, I was student pastor for, let's see, six, seven years, I guess it was, six years before that, uh, preaching weekly to sixth grade through twelfth grade. And now I get to lead a uh, uh, birth all the way through senior adults at our central campus, or as some of our pastors like to say, I am responsible from the womb to the tomb at Christ Place Central. Uh, and so in theory, anybody who attends uh, our campus, they will never leave my ministry until the Lord calls them home, or I get another promotion, as Pastor Michael um, said. Um, I've been married for six years six years, that's correct. And uh, we have two beautiful kids. Our daughter, Audrey, is five. Our son, Beckett, will be four in November. And um, they are an absolute handful. I'm going to have plenty of really Beckett stories uh, this morning. Um, Audrey is our rule follower. Beckett is our interesting child. We'll just put it that way. Um, he sees the rules as suggestions or as boundaries to be pushed, not things to be adhered to. Um, but I am excited to, to go from uh, Genesis chapter 45. And before we get into the chapter this morning, I want to give a recap of Joseph's life up to this point. If you're not familiar with the story, Joseph has had a lot take place in his life. He has been sold into slavery bright by his brothers. And uh, to be fair, Joseph maybe deserved it a little bit. He was kind of the little punk of the family. He rubbed it in his brother's face that they would one day bow down to him. So they were jealous of that, sold him into slavery. And then after he was sold into slavery, he was taken into Egypt where he rose through the ranks and uh, became high up in command at Egypt. Then we know that he was thrown into prison for a crime that he did not commit. While in prison, he was forgotten by fellow prisoners who said that they would remember him and bring his name up to Pharaoh, in which they did not do that. And then when Pharaoh needed a dream interpreted, Joseph was given the opportunity to do so. And when he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, excuse me, he was promoted to second in command in all of Egypt. And then after being promoted, he oversaw the plan to save the kingdom of Egypt and surrounding areas from the famine. And then in the middle of all of this, his brothers come from their homeland to Egypt for food because of Joseph's plan. Egypt's the only one around with food. And then Joseph tests his brothers multiple times to see if they've actually changed or are remorseful for what they did to him or not. And in chapter 44 of Genesis, Joseph gives them the biggest test of all to see if their hearts have changed. He puts a, his very own chalice into Benjamin, the youngest brother's sack, sends them away, and basically sets them up for, are they going to be honest and defend Benjamin or are they not? And then we pick up in chapter 45 with what is going to take place. And this morning in chapter 45, Joseph finally reveals himself to his brothers. And in the midst of this revelation, Joseph revealing himself to his brothers, we learn something incredible about Joseph, his faith, and his response to hardships. I want you to think for a moment this morning, have you ever experienced a hardship in your life? Most of us would say yes. You know, there's the saying you're either coming out of a valley, in the middle of one, or about to go into one. We all fall into one of three places. And you can take the word valley out and put hardship. Every single one of us have experienced hardships. 
But it's not a question of if we will experience a hardship. The question is what will we do and how we, will we respond, excuse me, when we experience hardship. You see, how you and I respond to a hardship has everything to do with how you and I view God. It comes down to this word perspective. When you and I have the right perspective on God and who God is and how God works, we will have the right perspective on any hardship that we may face. You know, perspective is an extremely powerful thing. From the right angle or from the right perspective, things can look great. From the wrong perspective, things can look quite bleak. In preparation for this message, I discovered something known as, uh, and um, uh, guys in the sound booth, I'll cue these slides because we can stay in order. There's something called a chalk street art. I'd never heard of it, but there you go. We'll go with this first slide. So I'll cue the next ones. So you can see this. And when you look at this from the wrong perspective, you're like, this looks like chaos. This means absolutely nothing. But from the right perspective, we'll go to that next slide. All of a sudden, this chalk art looks the way the artist intended it to look. We have another example, if you go to that next slide. So another example of chalk art from the wrong perspective doesn't look like a whole lot, but go to the next slide. From the right perspective, and we'll stay here for a second. From the right perspective, you can see what the artist intended for us to see. And then I have two more examples from the right perspective. You can go to that next one. That's here in Georgia, or was at one point. And then that last one there. Perfect. So the point is this, with this chalk art, from the wrong perspective, you can't see the big picture or what's going on. It looks like a chaos. It looks like a big mess. It looks pointless, right? In fact, it looks a lot of ways like my daughter or my son could have drawn it, right? But from the right perspective, we see everything the artist intended us to see. And when it comes to hardship or difficulty in life, church family, listen to me. From the wrong perspective, it looks like chaos. It looks like an utter mess. It looks like what in the world is going on here? But from the right perspective, we can see what God has been doing the entire time. We see the beautiful picture that God has been painting in our lives. So I ask you this question this morning. What perspective of God do you have when you face hardship? Do you have the right one or do you have the wrong one? You see, Joseph had the right perspective on his trials and his life. And our big point this morning, if you're taking notes, write this down is this. I want us to all understand that God is moving even when we can't see it. God is moving even when we can't see it. In the midst of hardship or trial, we may, may not be able to see all that God is doing, the picture that God is painting. But we can rest assured in full confidence and assurance that God is moving even if we can't see it, even if it doesn't make sense to us. We see this perfectly illustrated in Genesis 45. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to try to bring it to life the best I can. Genesis 45, it won't be on the screen. So you have your text in your Bible this morning. It says this. I'm reading from the ESV. Genesis 45 verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. So this is the point where he's just tested his brothers. Um, one of his brothers, Judah, has just said, I will take Benjamin's place, right? And so at this point, Joseph gets ready to reveal himself. It says this, he cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. So Joseph sends everyone out from his presence except for his brothers. Verse 2, and Joseph wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. Now let's, let's put some humanity to this. Now his brothers, they thought Joseph was dead. They did Joseph wrong. They sold him into slavery, right? And they now stand before the second most powerful man in the most powerful nation in the world at the time. And he reveals to them that he is Joseph. When it says that they were dismayed at his presence, what the Bible is saying is Joseph's brothers were terrified. And wouldn't you have been if you thought, oh my goodness, this man that we just ruined his life for no reason now has all authority to take away ours. So it says that they were nervous at what Joseph had said to them. Verse four, so Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and Joseph said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. 
Not comforting yet. <laughs> but look what it says in verse 5. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Look at what Joseph says. These are some great theological statements about God. A great perspective on hardship that we see in the following verses. Do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. Verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and Lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. And then Joseph would give his brothers instructions to go tell his father that he is alive. And he would assure them in verse 11 that he's going to take care of them. And look at verse 15. And Joseph kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. In other words, what the Bible is telling us is Joseph has let them know that he has forgiven them. Everything is okay. And we finally see at verse 14. After that, his brothers talked with him. His brother's like, okay, we're good. He's not going to take away our lives. Verse 16, when the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers have come. It pleased Pharaoh and his servants. And in verses 17 through 20, we'll read them later. It says this, that Pharaoh basically took care of Joseph's brothers. He gave them the best of the land in Egypt, gave them the best wagons, the best food, the best resources. Verse 20, have no concern for your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Verses 21 through 24, like I said, we'll read in a moment here. Joseph sends his brothers away. Look at verse 25. So his brothers went out of Egypt and they came to the land of Canaan to their father, Jacob. And they told their father, Joseph is still alive and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart became numb for he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he saw all the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father, Jacob revived. Verse 28, and Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we see three clear truths of how we can have a better perspective on hardship this morning. Lord, we love you. God, I thank you for the incredible time of worship that we had to prepare our hearts for the preaching of your word. Lord, I just pray right now that it is not uh, my message or my words this morning, Lord, but it is yours. Pray that uh, no matter who we are, Lord, no matter what hardship we are going through or have been through, Lord, I pray that you remind all of us this morning that you are moving even when we can't see it. Lord, give us the right perspective on hardship and trials this morning. Lord, use Joseph and his example to teach us. We love you. We praise you. We pray this in your name. Amen. The first point we're going to see this morning on how to handle hardship, we need to understand this. Write this down if you're taking notes. We need to understand that God is in control. God is in control. No matter what difficulty you face, no matter what hardship you are going through, God is is in control the entire time. Joseph acknowledges such in Genesis 45. Look back at verses five through eight, it says this. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourself because you sold me here. And now here we're gonna read a few more verses four times. Joseph is going to make mention of God's control. Time number one is here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. If you wanna underline or um, highlight those phrases. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. So I'm out the seven years of famine. Time number two, and God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. Time number three, and then he says this, God has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Four times in these four verses, Joseph mentions that God was sovereign and in control the entire time. And what's interesting is when you read the life of Joseph in Genesis, this is the first time out loud publicly that Joseph has acknowledged this. Now imagine if you're Joseph, you've experienced all that he has experienced. You're wondering why in the world has the Lord allowed these things to happen to me? And then in this moment, it clicks with him. And he publicly professes, God, 
You had this under control the entire time. You knew exactly what you were doing. Joseph could finally step back, go back to that chalk art, and he could see the proper perspective of the story that God was writing and the role that God had written Joseph to play the entire time. Joseph was never in control of what was going on, but God was always in control. You see, something that we as people struggle with is this. We love to be in charge, do we not? We love to be in control. I personally have major control issues. Major control issues, okay? Some people view it as me being detailed or me wanting to know what's going on. That's great. I'm glad people have that perspective on it. In my mind, it's because I like to be in control. Now, some people, you're more laid back with it. I don't understand that. How you can float through life not being in control stresses me out. I like being in control. And if you're honest with yourself, you do too. Every single one of you love to be in control. But the sooner we recognize that we have zero control, <laughs> the more enjoyable life becomes. Would you not agree? You see, when I try to control everything in my life, I'm absolutely miserable because I fail every step of the way. But when you and I recognize that we aren't in control, all of a sudden the stress, the burden comes off of us. And we realize that God is in control. We realize that the one person who needs to be in control is actually in charge and knows what's going on. And you see, when you and I try to play God or try to be in control, here's what we do. We mess it up every single time. If you think about your own life, the times where you have royally messed things up, it's because you've tried to play God. You've skipped steps that God outlined for you, or, Lord forbid, you didn't even take it to the Lord in prayer. You just thought, I've got this under control, and you end up messing everything up. You see, God is in control. We are not. And here's what I, I, I found myself doing, is I try to figure God out. I try to say, okay, Lord, well, why are you doing this? Well, what are you doing here? And then in, my, in the midst of me figuring things out, I end up messing things up. But Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, it'll be on the screen. It teaches us this very clear truth about how God operates. It says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 teaches us the simple truth. You and I are not God. And it doesn't just stop there that you and I aren't God. It teaches us that we will never understand how God works or how he operates. We will never figure God out. For some of us, that's a major disappointment, right? But for others, it should be an encouragement to know that the longer you and I walk with the Lord, we sang about it earlier, the longer you and I walk with the Lord, we know that we will never discover the depths of who God is and how he works. There is always going to be something new to learn about God. We don't think the way he thinks. I mentioned earlier, I have uh, two toddlers. Well, I guess Audrey's not so much a toddler anymore, being five. And um, uh, Audrey is wired identical to me. Um, I mean, her and I, I love her to death. Even at five, we already butt heads because she likes to argue. Um, she thinks she's right even when she's not. And even when she's been told she's not right, she digs her heels in even more. Um, and then she has to have the last word at five years old. Can you believe that? We're trying to teach her, you just say yes, sir. If you just say yes, sir, and move on, you will live long and prosper in the Martin household. Um, and she hasn't figured that out quite yet, right? And, um, with Audrey, I'm wired just like her, excuse me, she's wired just like me, and yet here's what I've learned. I still have no idea what goes on in her head. She does the weirdest things. She will say something way off the wall, way out in left field, it will make us laugh, and then she will stop and wink at me. And I'm like, what are you doing? Who taught you to do that, right? Now my son, I feel so bad for Mary Beth, there are three Joshua Martins living in the household. Now, Beckett is wired equally like me. But he got the strong-willed, stubborn part. But you take strong-willed and stubborn, and you add defiance on top of it. Be praying for us, because, <laughs> yes. And so, um, with Audrey, she's not so defiant with Beckett. Beckett is the weirdest one of the bunch. I have no idea what's going on in that three-year-old boy's head. And if you have kids or grandkids, especially if they were three-year-old boys at one point, you can never understand what's happening in their noggin. 
they speak a foreign language in my mind. The other day, Beckett crawled in our bed. We hadn't gotten up yet, and he was laying next to me, and I thought we were having this nice father-son moment. And um, I roll over, I open my eyes, and he's staring at me. He's laying on the pillow, and he touches my nose and just goes, boop. Nobody taught him to do that. He just did it. And I'm like, son, what are you doing? I will never figure my kids out. And I keep getting the most encouraging information from people who have raised uh, uh, teenagers and college kids. They keep telling me, that, telling me that it only gets worse and more difficult. And I'm like, <laughs> where's the encouragement there, right? I'll never figure them out. Here's the thing. I try to. It just makes me grumpy. The same thing happens when you and I try to figure out God. It just leads to frustration because we're not in control. We don't know what's going on in God's head. We don't always see the big picture. And as I said earlier, the sooner that you and I realize this, the more pleasant life becomes because it's miserable and frustrating trying to know and be in control of everything because it is a never-ending, worthless, doomed-to-fail pursuit. The best advice I can give us this morning, and Joseph understood this, it's this, is to let God be God, because he's way better at it than you and I are. Proverbs 16, 9 says this, that it's the Lord who establishes our steps. We need to allow God to be God, and we need to understand the role that we play in the story, and we're not the grand orchestrator of everything going on. We're just happy to be invited to what the Lord is doing. And so Joseph understood in these verses, he acknowledges that God is in control the entire time. He's finally able to see God's hand in everything that he had experienced. And here's how he could say this. It's because he had the right perspective. You see, the right perspective on God doesn't focus on the here and now. The right perspective on God doesn't focus on just what God is doing in the moment. It doesn't focus just on the pain or hardship you are experiencing. The right perspective on God is what we call an eternal mindset or perspective. It's understanding that we are playing a small role in something way bigger than ourselves. And here's how that brings us comfort. It brings us comfort in knowing that if God knows what he's doing, then there is a purpose in what we are going through then we're not going through what we're going through for nothing. There's a reason behind it. And when we understand and have this, this, this mindset, this eternal mindset that God is in control, it allows us to do several things. Write these down. One, we understand that God is in control. It gives us the freedom to forgive others. It doesn't matter what somebody has done to you, how somebody has wronged you. We can offer forgiveness because we know that God is in control. There's a bigger reason behind it. Joseph forgives his brothers. It also gives us peace and joy. Look at Genesis 14 and 15. Then Joseph fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and he wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck and he kissed all of his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. Where we see joy and peace in this passage is this, is decades of bitterness and frustration and unforgiveness that Joseph may have had against his brothers. But not just Joseph, decades of shame and guilt that his brothers would have dealt with all go away in this one moment. And the, the family has been restored. There's peace, there's joy. But not only do we have peace and joy, can we forgive others? The third thing you see on the screen is this. We can move forward. We can move forward. Joseph would tell his brothers in verses 21 through 24, he loads them up, he sends them on their way, and he says, go get my father and bring him back. In other words, Joseph was ready to move forward with his life. When you and I don't recognize that God is in control, we stay stuck. We stay stuck in sin. We stay stuck in shame. We stay stuck in guilt, unforgiveness, confusion, whatever it might be. But the moment that we see that God is moving, even when we can't see it, we can move forward. And we can see that God has a plan the entire time. So point number one this morning, we see that God is in control. Number two is this. We can know that there is purpose in the pain. There is purpose in the pain. When we understand that God is in control, it gives us the ultimate comfort that you and I aren't experiencing the hardship we're experiencing for nothing. There's a reason behind it. It's not random. It's not an accident. There's a purpose in it. There is purpose in the pain. You know, we all have different thoughts and views of pain. Some of us have a high pain tolerance, right? 
Some of us have a very low pain tolerance. Again, I'll use my kids as an illustration. My daughter has an extremely low pain tolerance. In fact, we would say that she is dramatic about it at any instance, right? Um, She is very dramatic about pain. My son, on the other hand, is, it is disturbing how high his pain tolerance is, especially when discipline is being doled out. Uh, A few months ago, my son was playing in the house being a boy and he tripped and fell into the corner of some furniture and it cut his ear and um, his earlobe. And uh, we FaceTimed one of our friends who is a nurse and she said, you need to go take him to the emergency room. He needs to get that stitched right away. And um, I have to give credit to my son. He handled getting those stitches in like a champ. He didn't shed a single tear. In fact, he just looked at the doctor like, why are you messing with me? Because he was watching Toy Story or something like that on my wife's phone. But he did great. And me and Mary Beth could not help but think to ourselves, Lord, we're so glad that it was Beckett that this happened to. Because if it had been Audrey, the moment we stepped foot into the emergency room, we would have had to have sedate that girl. She would have lost her mind because she has a very low pain tolerance. And so regardless of how high or low your pain tolerance is, one thing we can all acknowledge in life is this. We will all experience pain. Every single one of us will experience pain. And not just physical pain, right? Physical pain heals for the most part. But we're going to experience deep-rooted pain. Emotional pain, right? Loss of a loved one collapse of a family unit, whatever it might be, every single one of us will experience deep rooted pain. What we know of Joseph is Joseph had his share of pain. He was sold by his brothers. He was falsely in prison. He was forgotten about. But when we reread verses five through eight of Genesis 45, I want to say it again because it's such a great theological statement about our God. He says that it was for God who has sent me here before you to preserve life. For the famine had been in the land these two years. There are five years left of it. Look at verse 7. And God sent me before you. Why? To preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. It is God who has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house, ruler over all the land of Egypt. Joseph had a great perspective on the pain he had experienced. He understood that there was a purpose in it. What was that purpose? We see it over and over again in verses five through eight, to preserve life. God allowed Joseph to be sold into slavery. God allowed Joseph to be imprisoned. God allowed Joseph to be forgotten so he could interpret, Joseph, excuse me, interpret Pharaoh's dream at the right moment to give the God-given advice of taking the seven years of plentiful harvest and putting it away for the seven years of famine. And in doing so, God raised Joseph up to second in command in all of Egypt for this very moment not just to preserve life on earth, but to preserve the covenant that God had made with Abraham generations ago. To preserve the remnant of God's chosen people on the earth. Joseph understood in this moment, the Lord, that Lord, you allowed me to go through all of this so that people could be saved, so that lives could be spared. And when we understand that God is in control and there's purpose in the pain, church, we can understand that no matter what you've gone through, no matter what you are going through, no matter what you will go through, we can stand in confidence knowing that God is in control and is always moving. There is comfort in knowing that we are experiencing what we are experiencing for a reason. Romans 8 says this in verse 28, and I'm going to read verses 31 and 32. It says this, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, and for those who are called according to His purpose. Look at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Romans 8 is a New Testament clear reminder that God has a grander purpose in your life and in my life than we may ever see on this earth. And we also can stand in the confidence that it's not random, it's not accidental. It is for our benefit. It is for our good. Because God wants the best for you. He wants the best for me. And we may not see it manifested on earth, but we know ultimately when we get to heaven that we will see all that God was doing in our lives. And ultimately, our confidence comes from Christ and from knowing Him. 
Whether you and I go through pain or not, it is for our good. And as we said, we know whether we don't, even, even if we don't see it on earth, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we get to spend eternity with God in heaven. And you know what that means? Everything works out for our good, ultimately in the end, even if we can't see it in the moment. A couple of years ago, I read a great, great book called The Case for Faith by uh, Lee Strobel. The story there, he was a journalist, he was an atheist, and he basically saw, uh, uh, stood out on an experiment to prove that the Bible was false, God didn't exist, the gospel was a sham, all, all these things. And what's wild is in the process of doing interviews and uh, his own research, he ended up giving his life to Jesus. He realized that the thing that he was trying to disprove, there was actually a lot of evidence for it. And in the case for faith, his big idea was he was trying to disprove that, or, or, or to prove, excuse me, that people who live by faith are basically unintelligent, weak, and uh, it's just wishful thinking. And he ended up proving the opposite. And he's talking to a, a theologian, a pastor, it might have been a professor at college, and he basically asks the professor, the pastor, how can people remain faithful even in the midst of pain? What is the purpose of that? And uh, uh, the guy that, that Lee Strobel was interviewing gave a great word picture of how God operates. And he gives this word picture of a bear caught in a bear trap, like one of those old school bear traps, right? And so the thought is this, is that the bear's walking along and he steps on the trap, releases the spring, the trap clamps down on the bear's leg, right? Painful experience for the bear. Somebody comes along and says, hey, we want to release the bear. And uh, they don't want the bear to be trapped. And so what the person has to do is in order to release the bear, the person has to push the bear's leg further into the trap to release the spring, right? Now, in this story, the person pushing the, bear further, the bear's leg further into the trap is God, right? We're the bear. Now, the bear in the moment doesn't realize that the person's trying to help it. All the bear understands is, this hurts. Why are you pushing my leg further and further into the trap, right? Us as the bear, when we're experiencing pain or hardship, all we see is the pain and the hurt we're feeling. But God, or the person in the story, realizes or understands there's a purpose in the pain. There's a temporary pain, and then the trap will release. In the same way, in the same way, all we can see in the moment is, is hurt and is pain. What we don't see is the bigger picture of what God is doing and what God is working. It may be a temporary pain for a little bit that God is using us to, grow, to draw us closer to him, to have a gospel impact on someone else, or just to grow our faith. Or it could be pain that ends up where the Lord calls us home. Either way, we can rest assured that one, the pain is temporary, no matter how short or long it is, and two, there is a purpose in it, even if we can't see it in the moment. But what are some things that can keep us from seeing the purpose in the pain? One, if you're here this morning, you may not have a relationship with God, and if that is the case, you can't ever see the purpose in the pain. Because the only way that pain makes sense biblically is because of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life when I give my life to Jesus that can help me see what God is doing. Apart from that, all you're doomed to experience is pain. Maybe there's sin in your life that has disrupted your fellowship with God and it's keeping you from seeing what God is doing. Maybe it's because you have a desire for control like I do. This is my biggest struggle. I will not see what God is doing because I have to be in control. And then a fourth thing is this, and I think this is uh, true for all of us. It's because we have what I call an outcome-based faith. Your faith is dependent upon what God does or does not do in your life. You're almost like a fair weather fan of God. My favorite time of year is coming up, college football in August, and I can't wait. I am not a fair weathered Georgia football fan, but I know plenty of people who are fair weathered fans of whatever team, right? And the definition of a fair weathered fan is this. When the team does well, they cheer the team on. When the team not, doesn't do well, what does a fair weathered fan do? Stops cheering, doesn't pay attention, right? And I'd be a betting man, I'd wager to say this, that I might be looking at some potential fair weathered fans of God in the room. That when life is going well, when God is doing what you want him to do in your life, you're cheering him on. But the moment life gets difficult, the moment things spiral out of quote control, 
you're not the biggest fan of, of God anymore to continue that illustration. I want us to understand this. This will be on the screen. An outcome-based faith isn't real faith. An outcome-based faith isn't real faith. What I mean by that is this. If you say, I'm only get my faith in God is dependent upon how things turn out, that's not faith. That's treating God like a genie. Faith, by definition, is unwavering regardless of the outcome. And when we as followers of Christ have an outcome-based faith, we don't have real faith. Our faith waffles. One moment is strong, one moment it's not. And God has not called us to have an outcome-based faith. He's called us to have real faith. Because you see, an outcome-based faith, by definition, here's what it does. It puts confidence not in who God is, but what God does. And regardless of whether you experience it directly in your life or not, there's some things we know about God that are true in any season. God is good, no matter what you go through. God is faithful, no matter what you go through. God is gracious, no matter what you go through. God is merciful, and the list goes on and on and on. And here's the thing is, those things about God are not dependent upon what you're going through in life. They are true all the time. You see, we need to put our confidence in who God is, not just what God does. Because a proper perspective on God believes God is good and wants what's best for us, even when it's painful even in the midst of hardships, because God is moving even when we can't see it. The last thing we see this morning is this, is God is faithful and he honors our faithfulness. God is faithful and honors our faithfulness. Joseph remained faithful through everything he experienced it, and God used Joseph's faithfulness as a blessing to his family, to those around him, to the people of Egypt, Look at Genesis 45, 7. It says this, And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. You see, God used Joseph's hardships and Joseph's faithfulness to be a blessing to his family to preserve the covenant that God had made with Abraham. Look at verses 16 and 20. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers have come in. It pleased Pharaoh and his servants. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this. Load your beasts and go back to the land of Canaan. Take your father and your household and come to me. And I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. And you shall eat of the fat of the land. In other words, Pharaoh is saying, Joseph, tell your family to come back and I'm going to give him our best. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones, for your wives, and bring your father and come. Have no concern for your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Here we see God again, honoring Joseph's faithfulness in the hardships and difficulty to bless his family. Pharaoh is literally saying, Joseph, you can tell your family to leave their stuff because everything that I have, that is the best I will give to them. They're going to go from the famine-stricken land of Canaan to the plenty that is in Egypt. And then continue on, verses 25 and 28. It says, uh, Joseph's brothers finally make it back to Canaan. They go out of Egypt. They came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. And they said to Jacob, Joseph is alive. He is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart became numb, for he did not believe them. Verse 27. But when his brothers told Jacob, all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father, Jacob, revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. What do we see here over and over and over again? We see God's faithfulness and we see God honoring Joseph's faithfulness. You see, Joseph being faithful in the hardships God put him through didn't just impact Joseph. It had an impact on those around him. It had an impact on his family, on the people of Egypt, on the nations around them. That is why that we as followers of Christ must understand that God is always moving and have a proper eternal perspective. We must see the purpose and the pain, and here's why. This is where the rubber really meets the road for us on a day-to-day -day basis as we are followers of Christ and want to represent Jesus. We must see the purpose and the pain because if we don't, we become bitter and destructive. And I, I would say that few things are, are more of a turnoff to the gospel, to the lost world, than a bitter, frustrated, grumpy follower of Christ. It's true. 
When we don't see the purpose in the pain and we lash out, when we become frustrated, we become irritable, we become grumpy, we become bitter. What does that say to a lost world that's in desperate need of a savior? Not just about us, but what does it say about the savior that we claim to represent? But when we see purpose in the pain, other people notice the difference. You see, God never took his hand off of Joseph's life. He never forgot his covenant with Abraham. He's never forgotten what he was going to do in Joseph's life. And in the same way, listen to me, we can be reminded that God has not forgotten his promises to you and to me either. And so when we experience pain, God's calling us to be faithful. He's calling us to stand strong because what does it say if our faith wavers when things get bad? What does it say when we lash out if things don't go our way? Because if the world knows, if the people you work with, the people you spend time with, the people you vacation with, the people you go to the store with, whatever it might be, the people that God has placed in your sphere of influence, if they know you're going through a hardship and you lash out in bitterness and anger, what does it say? Because if they know that you're a follower of Jesus, you know what they're doing? They're putting you under a microscope to say, how does this follower of Christ respond in hardship? How does this follower of Christ respond in the midst of pain and difficulty? And if you and I respond the same way the rest of the world does, then why does a lost world need a savior? God's calling you and I to stand faithful, to stand strong, and to represent him even in the midst of difficult. Because when we stand strong, God is glorified. First and foremost, God is glorified. But the second thing is this. When you and I stand strong in difficulty, other people are pointed to Christ. Because there's a lot of hardship and difficulty in the world. Every single day. You watch the news. You read the news. You talk with people. Someone somewhere. Somebody that you know is going through a hard time. They don't need more frustration. They don't need more anger or bitterness. They're looking for answers. And we firmly believe that the answer to every question they could ever ask is found in the person of Jesus. And if they know that you have a relationship with Jesus, you know who they're looking to to give them those answers? You. You. They want to see that there's something genuinely different about you and me when we claim to follow Jesus and when we experience a difficult time. And when we do experience a difficult time and we handle it well, you know what that says? It says that we serve a Savior who is strong, who is powerful, who is greater than any any difficulty we could face. And that peace and joy that you experience will be so noticeable to everyone around you and they will want it as well. Points people to Jesus. But in order to do so, we must have a proper perspective on God and understand that God is moving even when we can't see it. As we move into our invitation, I have a few questions that I want us to, to pray through, think through before I invite Pastor Michael to come up and issue our response. It's this. Are you playing God in your life? Do you have to be in control? You see, when you and I are in control, we will never see that God is moving. We will never have a proper perspective. Go back to that chalk art at the very beginning. It will always look like chaos and a mess. Never get to see the grand picture that God is painting in our lives. When you and I have to be in control, I ask you this question. What would happen if you gave up that control? Or even better, What if you understood that you never had it to begin with? This morning, if you're struggling with control, I want to challenge you in a time of invitation and response. Maybe you need to go before the Lord in prayer and repent of that desire to be in control. Maybe you say, Lord, I'm not in control. I never was. I don't want to be. I'm giving you back control. I want you to play God because you're way better at it than I am. Maybe you need to repent of that. Ask you another question this morning. What pain have you experienced or are you currently experiencing? And I want to encourage you to remember that there is purpose in it. And that is God is moving even when you can't see it. If you're going through a hard time this morning, I ask you this question. Your practical next step this morning is this. Have you taken a step back and given that hardship over to the Lord? Have you taken a step back to say, Lord, I don't know what's going on but I don't have to know. I'm trusting you. If you're going through a hardship this morning, I challenge you to take that to the Lord. Finally, I want to remind you of this, that God is so faithful and he honors us when we are faithful to him. Are there areas in your life in which you need to be faithful where you currently aren't? And the answer is yes. (laughs) 
Every single one of us have that. And finally, this morning, maybe you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. You don't even know what that means. One thing I love about studying the life of Joseph is Joseph is a, a wonderful parallel to Jesus in many ways. And here's what I mean. Joseph endured suffering, pain, hardship. Why? So that many people might be saved. And in the same way, Jesus, God's one and only son, came down to earth, lived a perfect, sinless life. And what did he do? He suffered. He experienced pain and hardship. Why? So that many may be saved. And if you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus or you have questions, you can come find myself or Pastor Michael in the time of response. And I want you to know this. When you give your life to Jesus... That's the first step in beginning to understand that God is moving even when you can't see it. Because the very hardship or pain you're going through right now may be the very thing that God is using to draw you into a saving relationship with Him. Because the alternative is this. Apart from Jesus, you have no hope. You have no peace. You have no comfort. And to talk about this eternity where we, me as a follower of Christ, I get to see God's goodness work out in the end. You won't get to experience that. You'll experience God's wrath and his punishment on sin. Because you see, there's a price to be paid for sin and one of two people will pay it. Either you will in eternity in a very real place called hell apart from God or you can accept the gift that Jesus paid that price for you. And so if you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus, your next step is simple. Let today be the day you go from death to life in the name of Jesus and in the power of the gospel. Don't let fear, don't let hesitation or a 20-foot walk stand between you and giving your life to Jesus. So I'm going to pray. Pastor Michael will uh, start our response time, and I just want to challenge you to respond and pray as the Lord leads. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time in your word. God, I thank you for the simple truths that we've discovered in Genesis 45 of how you are moving even when we can't see it, Lord. And Lord, I just pray for anyone here that is going through a hardship, they'll be encouraged that there's purpose in the pain. And God, that all of us will be challenged to represent you well, no matter what we go through or experience in life. For anyone here who does not know you, God, I pray that today is the day they give their heart and life to you. Lord, move this morning, change hearts and lives, lead us to respond accordingly and in obedience. We pray this in your name. Amen.